What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing I wanna talk about today is, oh man, the story involving the Air Force and racial slurs. In late September, racist slurs were found on the message boards of five black cadet candidates at the Air Force Academy Preparatory School in Colorado Springs. The vandalism was written in black marker, and it said, go home, N-word. And after learning of the incident, Academy Superintendent, Lieutenant General Jay Silveria gathered thousands of cadets and staff to hear a very important message. If you're outraged by those words, then you're in the right Right place. That kind of behavior has no place at the prep school, it has no place at USAFA, and it has no place in the United States Air Force. I would be naive, and we would all be naive to think that everything is perfect here. We would be naive to think that we shouldn't discuss this topic. We would also be tone deaf not to think about the backdrop of what's going on in our country. Things like Charlottesville and Ferguson, the protests in the NFL. That's why we have a better idea. This is our institution and no one can take away our values. No one can write on a board and question our values. No one can take that away from us. If you can't treat someone with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you can't teach someone from another gender, whether that's a man or a woman, with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. If you demean someone in any way, then you need to get out. And if you can't treat someone from another race or a different color skin with dignity and respect, then you need to get out. Grab your phones, I want you to videotape this so that you have it, so that you can use it, so that we all have the moral courage together. All of us on the staff tower, lining the glass, all of us in this room. This is our institution. And if you need it, and you need my words, then you keep these words. And you use them, and you remember them, and you share them, and you talk about them. If you can't treat someone with dignity and respect, then get out. An amazing and strong message and video of that speech went viral. Millions of views on Facebook, YouTube, tens of thousands of retweets on Twitter. Many were pleased with the Academy's strong response to the incident, including Vice President Joe Biden and Senator John McCain. And so with that, the Air Force Academy launched an internal investigation to find the person behind this. And the big news this week is Academy officials said they found the person responsible for the slurs. In a written statement, the Air Force Academy said, we can confirm that one of the cadet candidates who was allegedly targeted by racist remarks written outside their dorm room was actually responsible for the act. The individual admitted responsibility and this was validated by the investigation. Oh no, this is one of the worst ways this could have gone down. Lieutenant Colonel Alan Heritage, the Director of Public Affairs with the Academy, later explained that the cadet responsible, quote, received administrative punishment and is no longer at the preparatory school. Their statement also saying, we acknowledge that there may be additional information already in the public space, but we will refrain from discussing further details surrounding the investigation due to Privacy Act requirements. And that seemed to be in reference to a report by the Gazette. That report saying the candidate committed the act in a bizarre bid to get out of trouble he faced at the school for other misconduct. So essentially the allegation there was that person was in trouble, they did something wrong. And that cadet came up with the bright idea of, well, no one can be angry at me if someone calls me the N-word. And then seemingly to divert suspicion, did it to five people instead of just being the sole victim. I mean, honestly, no matter the reason, this is horrible, this is disgusting. The long game victims of falsely reporting hate crimes are the actual victims of hate crimes. Stuff like this makes it so much harder for people making legitimate reports to be taken seriously. I mean, this is the second time just this week that it was exposed that a hate crime didn't actually occur. There was that story out of Kansas where there was all that racist graffiti on that black man's car. This week, he admitted to putting the graffiti on his own car as part of a, quote, Halloween prank. Okay, black Joey Salads, that's not a prank. That was a lie, you race-baiting asshole. But back to the main story, if there is a silver lining to this, seeing this sort of reaction, even if it was in response to a hoax, in response to the false reporting of a hate crime. But still, after the fact, the Air Force Academy said in a statement, racism has no place at the Academy in any shape or form. Regardless of the circumstances on under which those words were written, they were written and that deserved to be addressed. You can never overemphasize the need for a culture of dignity and respect and those who don't understand those concepts aren't welcome here. And that's where we're gonna end that one because I feel like we have to focus on the silver lining of that otherwise just disgusting story. But from there, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in Awesome brought to you by dbrand and defrancogrip.com. And I've actually mentioned the dbrand grip before but they have now finally launched their crowdfunding campaign. It is a grippy is all hell phone case which I love because essentially now as a dad of two, I live my 
my life one hand at a time. That is the weirdest way I could have said that. Screw it, I'm keeping it in. What I mean is I usually always am at least holding one child, and so when I'm looking at my phone, I just have my one hand. That falls and breaks, I'm screwed. Now, a thing of note with the D-Brand Grip is they just launched this past weekend. All the early bird perks were gone within a couple of hours. But the fantastic news is they've now provided an exclusive secret perk for you beautiful bastards. If you go to defrancogrip.com, you can order there for 50% off the retail price with free shipping in North America. So if you want to get the grip, you want to get the discount while you can, click that link in the description down below. And just a note here that I want to make that is, that is aside from the sponsor read, I want to give much love to D-Brand in, in a world and a time where it feels like loyalty and support is, is just, it's very rare. When we went solo several months ago where we didn't know if we were going to crash or fail or what was going to happen, they were they were the first company to sign on and say, what can we do? We're not launching something for several months, but we love the show. We, we believe in what you're doing. How can we help? So much love to them. And the first bit of awesome I have to share is a Joel Osteen <laughs> impersonator. Joel Osteen impersonator. Joel Osteen, of course, a televangelist. An impersonator went to one of his events, was able to get all the way down to the stage and trick so many, many people. It was fascinating and amazing to watch. Then we got a new Hot Ones with Wale. Then we had the Stranger Things kids making a Motown super group with James Corden. Then we got a trailer for a new Netflix series called Dark, which looks incredibly creepy. And if you'd like to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. Then in internet outrage and boycotting news, let's talk about Mila Kunis and Jim Beam. If you don't know, Mila Kunis, of course, an actress, but she is also the spokesperson for the whiskey brand Jim Beam. And recently in an interview with Conan O'Brien, she revealed that she had been sending anonymous donations donations to Planned Parenthood in the vice president's name. I put him on a list of reoccurring um, uh, donations that are made in his name to Planned Parenthood. And so... It's because she disagrees with some of Mike Pence's stances. And after the donation is received, Planned Parenthood sends a letter to Mike Pence thanking him for his generosity. And so this happens every month. And it should also be noted that Mila Kunis is not the only one doing this. So after this segment aired, there was a lot of outrage, but Mila Kunis already kind of knew that this was going to happen. During the interview, she says, this is when the hate mail comes my way. I apologize if I'm offending anybody. But of course, still, you can't control how people receive what you do. And so we saw Pence supporters and pro-life activists taking to Twitter to launch the Boycott Beam campaign, calling on Jim Beam to end its association with Mila Lacunas. Some of the tweets, Justin Emery writes, I own six retail liquor stores in Missouri and we've pulled your products off our shelves. You can thank Mila Kunis. RD, Jim Beam supports murdering babies via their spokesperson, Mila Kunis. Finley Jameson said, would Jim Beam retain a spokesman who bragged about donating to the NRA in Joe Biden's name as a way to mock the Obama admin? Now, because all of this is connected to Planned Parenthood, of course, this is a very polarizing issue. And on topics like this, as a public figure like Mila Kunis, there, there's really a, a no-win situation. This isn't like when you had snowflakes angry at Starbucks because there was a war against Christmas. War against Christmas. You have two groups that see Planned Parenthood with two different eyes. One group sees it as an important, irreplaceable source of preventative care, and the other sees it as a baby murdering factory. And like Louis C.K. mentioned in one of his last comedy specials, although he's probably not the best person to mention today, if the way you viewed what was happening with an abortion wasn't that cells were being removed from a body, but that it was just straight up baby murder, how could you not be passionate? And so agree or disagree, I can't bash them for, for moving forward with this protest. We live in a free society, a market society, so people can, like Mila Kunis, can can go out and say and do whatever. And then society, or in this case, the market can respond. Now, does that essentially serve as a threat to keep celebrities from voicing their true opinion? Yeah, kind of, depending on the situation, especially with mainstream brands. That said, will the boycott be successful? I mean, that remains to be seen. The company hasn't released a comment or Mila Kunis yet, but I will say I am genuinely interested to see what happens here, just because it feels like a test case. Nowadays, it feels like news is thrown in your face at all times, every single day. People are angry and outraged about this thing, that thing. Do, do people actually have the follow through to stay with it or are they constantly darting to the next thing? We'll see. Also, I feel I should talk about it because I made a quick mention to Louis C.K. earlier. There were initial reports that a New York Times article about Louis C.K. was going to come out. It has since come out. That headline reading, Louis C.K. crossed a line into sexual misconduct, five women say. And what's really interesting to me is that this story will be taken uh, very seriously because it is in the New York Times, but but part of this story w was news years ago. Years ago, Gonker posted articles about some of the accusations mentioned in this Times article. But you might remember somehow that story ended up just disappearing. And the allegations in the Times are very similar to one another. Comedian, writer, actress Rebecca Corey says back in 2005, she's working as a performer and producer on a television pilot. Louis C.K., a guest star, approached her as she was walking onto the set. She says, he leaned close to my face and said, can I ask you something? I said yes. And then he asked if we could go to my dressing room so he could masturbate in front of me. The Times writes, stunned and angry, Miss Corey said she declined, pointed out that he had a daughter and a pregnant wife. His face got red, she recalled, and he told me he had issues. It was then reported that the show's executive producers, Courtney 
Cox and David Arquette were informed, and they confirmed with the Times that this happened. Courtney Cox writing in an email, what happened to Rebecca on that set was awful. In 2003, Abby Schachner says, she said she called Louis C.K. to invite him to one of her shows, and during the phone conversation, she said she could hear him masturbating as they spoke. Then in 2002, there was a story around Dana Men Goodman and Julia Wolo. They say Louis C.K. invites them to a hotel room, you know, to have a nightcap. The bars were closed, they wanted to celebrate. Then they say Louis C.K. asked if he could take his penis out, masturbate, they thought he was joking. They said he was not joking, he actually did it. And the Times writes, they said they were holding on to each other, screaming and laughing in shock as Louis C.K. masturbated in a chair. We were paralyzed, Miss Goodman said. After he ejaculated on his stomach, they said they fled. And after, quote, he was like, which one is Dana and which one is Julia? Miss Goodman recalled. And then there was a fifth woman's story who asked not to be named with a story from the 90s. She said she was working in production at the Chris Rock Show when Louis C.K., a writer and producer there, repeatedly asked her to watch him masturbate, adding she was in her early 20s and went along with his request, but later questioned his behavior. In addition to the allegations, some of the women also shared apologies that were from Louis C.K. The Times saying they reviewed them. Now before this story even broke, Louis C.K. was reacting to it. The premiere of his new film, I Love You Daddy, was canceled, so he'll no longer be going to that. He was also scheduled to be on The Late Show with Colbert. That has now been canceled with William H. Macy set to replace him. And so that's where we are as of right now. It will be very interesting to see how Louis C.K. responds. Also, what will the fallout from this be? In the past, Louis C.K. has refused to comment on the allegations, saying if they were rumors, saying if you actually participate in a rumor, you make it bigger and you make it real. So will we see something different from him? And also, what's the public reaction going to be to this? Because if you've looked at all the accusations that have come out recently, it does very much feel that in the public, how much you are liked is how much of the benefit of the doubt you get. But like I said, I'm recording this just after the story broke. It will be very interesting to see what happens. I will say some things that are interesting to me. It is very interesting that Louis' show on FX already gave us the perfect graphic. Also, the clip from that show becomes far creepier post-allegations. And later I'm gonna masturbate and I'm gonna think about you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And finally, three, if we can if we can turn this into a teachable moment, which it really shouldn't have to be a teachable moment. Don't just whip your dick out and start masturbating in front of a woman or anyone. Additionally, it's important to be aware of power differences. If you're a famous person, you're a producer or a director, and you're doing this to someone that is below you, beneath you, either in, in fame or position at a company, you're very likely in creepy, not okay territory where that person's just uh, very pressured to go along with you. But that said, we are where we are right now. We're going to wait for a response, but while we wait, I would love to know your thoughts from this story. Do you think there's too much smoke for there to be no fire here? Do you think that there is a difference between this Louis C.K. situation and many of the other stories we're seeing right now? I'd love to know what you're thinking and where you're coming from. And then let's talk about this story around Trump, the Department of Justice, CNN, AT&T, and Time Warner. So what's happening? Well, this whole story starts October of 2016. AT&T announces that they want to buy Time Warner for $84.5 billion. And of course, as you'd expect, there are many criticisms of this deal. The main one being that since AT&T purchased DirecTV, they were the largest paid TV operator in the United States. They're also the second largest wireless data provider and the third largest broadband provider. So if they buy a large content provider, there would be more incentive for them to prioritize their own content over others. Give their users faster speed to their products, make it more accessible. And so the Department of Justice has been looking into this. It's part of the antitrust laws with mergers of this size. Essentially any deal like this over $80.8 million has to be investigated by the FTC and DOJ. So then we fast forward to yesterday where we see the Financial Times reporting that the Department of Justice is going to require the sale of CNN in order to approve this acquisition. And the Financial Times built this argument that the department has been motivated by Trump's hatred of CNN, that this is his way of punishing the network. Also reportedly sources close to the merger have said that the Department of Justice gave AT&T a couple of options in order to approve the deal. One of those is sell Turner Broadcasting, which is the parent company to CNN, this along with Cartoon Network, TNT, Hulu, others. Or one of the other options would be for AT&T to sell DirecTV. But also there was another source claiming that AT&T representatives offered to sell, but the Department of Justice rejected that as not being enough. But that account was secondhand. It's also been disputed by AT&T's CEO, Randall Stevenson saying, until now we've never commented on our discussions with the DOJ. But given the DOJ's statement this afternoon, it's important to set the record straight. Throughout this process, I have never offered to sell CNN and have no intention of doing so. But the thing I need to point out with his statement is he said the Department of Justice's statement, but they, they didn't make one. What he's actually responding to is leaked information, an unnamed source was saying this. But this is of course a side story to the main story. Many people are concerned and many people believe that Trump has the Department of Justice blocking this merger because he does not like CNN. As far as if that is actually the case, it's not completely clear. What we do know is in 2016, while on the campaign trail, Trump commented on the merger. As an example of the power structure I'm fighting, AT&T is buying Time Warner and thus CNN, a deal we will not approve in my administration because it's too much concentration of power in the hands 
of too few. But there was also a report in the New York Times back in July that said, quote, White House advisors have discussed a potential point of leverage over their adversary, a senior administration official said. A pending merger between CNN's parent company, Time Warner, and AT&T. Mr. Trump's Justice Department will decide whether to approve the merger, and while analysts say there is little to stop the deal from moving forward, the president's animus towards CNN remains a wild card. But in response to those allegations, White House Deputy Press Secretary Raj Shah said, the president did not speak with the attorney general about this matter, and no White House official was authorized to speak with the Department of Justice on this matter. And it's also important to note, there have been some very big anti-Trump people in the news that are also against this merger. Richard Blumenthal, Democrat, Senator of Connecticut, writing, I've long opposed AT&T Time Warner merger because of its impact on competitors and consumers. DOJ must continue its thorough and exacting review. Even Bernie Sanders has spoken out about this, writing, the administration should kill the Time Warner AT&T merger. This deal would mean higher prices and fewer choices for the American people. And ultimately where I land on this is, is could Trump's disdain for CNN be a big part of this? Sure, but at that point, I feel like we're arguing over intent, thought crimes. And for him, it could just be the happy situation that there is genuine problems with this merger. And also, if the reporting is accurate, the Department of Justice is offering multiple options and one of them just happens to be the CNN thing, then it feels less targeted. But of course, that's just my personal takeaway and I'd love to know your thoughts on this story. And that's actually where I'm going to end today's show. And remember, if you liked this video, you like what I try and do on this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you want to catch up, click or tap right there to watch that. Or if you want to see the newest behind the scenes vlog, click or tap right there to watch that. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. Maybe. I'm thinking about retooling the Friday show, so just uh, keep your eyes open.